Hey everyone, welcome to Deep Dive MH370. We are on to episode number three. I'm Andy Tarnoff, the publisher and founder of On Milwaukee, and I am joined by Jeff Wise, who is an aviation expert, journalist, and the guy who understands this topic more than anyone in the world, at least in my opinion. Well, thank you very much, Andy. Uh, that's a very nice uh, introduction. Yes, I am kind of one of the MH370 guys. I wrote a book called The Taking of MH370, which... Uh, hey, check it I've... out. I got it in my oh, studio. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah. I, noticed, I noticed it was attractive and, and homey looking, and I get, and that's that's probably part of it. Um, no, your, your studio looks great. This is, by the way, our first uh, time we're doing a video recording of our, of our podcast. We're trying to branch out into all the medias. Um, but um, so, so this is exciting. I do on our third episode and I think we're getting deeper and deeper into the guts of the mystery. Yeah. So we left off after day one, which was when MH370 took off from Kuala Lumpur and headed Northeast and then poof, it disappeared. it disappeared from air traffic control radar screens. Uh, and it wasn't until a while later that that was that that was uh, realized by the people in charge. And so we're going to we're going to talk about what happened next. And then um, I also just want to give reader, uh, listeners a head up heads up that uh, after we talk about the sort of gist of, of today's episode, we're going to try to with each episode sort of move the discussion along and kind of cut through, you know, slice the loaf of bread slice by slice. To, 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 as we build towards a really comprehensive understanding of this mystery. But um, today we're going to do something new, which is we're going to deal with some some contemporary topics, some latest developments um, yeah, that what's, have to what's, do with the status. What's neat about this, or interesting about this, even nine years later, this topic is still evolving. And in just the last few days, uh, by the time you listen to this, maybe the last few weeks, there will be some new developments. And that's why this is not stuck in time as a true, a true crime story. This is, um, this is an evolving story. So I, I wouldn't say we have breaking news, but we have new things to talk about. So yeah. let's dive in. Let's dive into yeah. to where we left off and then, okay. then we'll get into the new stuff. And maybe we'll jump around a little bit. Sure, that sounds great. Okay, so um, we left off where it had disappeared off of uh, secondary radar and well, right. and primary radar at that point. Um, but it turns out that um, it popped back up again. So as the story was unfolding, as the um, authorities were trying to figure out what happened, there were all these rumors flying around, and there was, um, you know, there were some rumors that maybe the plane had landed in Cambodia. Um, and and it was really there's kind of the fog of war. They're trying to understand what had happened, and um, as the days went by, um, th there was uh, a, a new rumor that began to spread, and um, up up until that time, all all they knew, all the authorities knew was, and that they had conveyed to the public was that the plane had disappeared from air traffic control radars, and then there were rumors that something else was happening. The authorities weren't being on totally on the up and up about do you remember how how you started hearing about these rumors because before malaysia came clean um there was chatter right yeah there were there were things filtering out reporters were saying that um that sources had indicated that the malaysian military had actually picked up this plane now, as, as we talked about last, last episode when the plane disappeared from air traffic control radar the assumption was that it had crashed that was the most likely assumption, given what had happened historically in the past in similar such incidences. This was now a stunning idea. The idea that, no, actually, it hadn't crashed at all. It had kept flying. But the Malaysian authorities, the military in particular, were denying this at first. And so what we and so what I remember what I had is that so they initially had set up a search area in the South China Sea under the path where the plane had last been seen. Then they started dispatching ships and aircraft to search somewhere else entirely, other part of the country, on the on the western side of the Malay Peninsula, uh, around the the what's called the Malacca Strait and the Andaman Sea, which is the bit of ocean in between Malaysia and India. Yeah. So eventually Malaysia came clean and said. Um... Well, actually, our military radar had tracked a plane or something. It could have been birds. They didn't say what it was. Um, using the radar that is the old-fashioned ping, you know, not, not one with transponders, of this 
plane or thing that looked like a plane now heading west and people were astounded right so this is this is the primary radar this is something that doesn't require any electrical transmissions from the plane the, everything it seems on the plane had been turned off so the plane was flying um kind of in stealth mode you might say although it's not a stealth yeah. aircraft don't get me wrong but the plane had sort of turned off all of the things that usually uh uses to broadcast its location and was flying dark as it were electronically dark but it was still visible to these primary radars which are shining electromagnetic uh, uh radiation into the atmosphere into this into space and and watching it to be reflected back so it's like shining a flashlight so it's as if this these radar systems were shining a flashlight and they saw this plane come from the direction where MA37 has, has last been spotted, flew back over the Malaysian Peninsula, actually flew over a Malaysian Air Force base, flew to this island off the west coast of, of the Malayan Peninsula called um, Penang, and then had turned and flown straight up this body of water that lies in between Indonesia and Thailand. So all this so, blows my mind. <laughs> I mean, right? This was very us. unexpected. Yeah. So first of all, this this uh, this shiny object is flying at like twenty nine thousand feet or something like that, right. which is not that different than what it would have been flying when uh, it disappeared. I think it was maybe at thirty five thousand feet, but it's definitely like an appropriate cruising altitude for a triple seven. Yeah, Pr probably not birds. I no, think. it's definitely not birds. The the the, the suspicion. I mean, the Malay. So so the obvious question is, okay, how come you didn't tell us this right away? That was the really the burning question. And the families yeah. remember. The families are still left wondering. Well, what happened? Where are my loved ones? And how? And and when when they when everyone realized that the Malaysian military had not been forthcoming, um, had denied at at, at one point that they had found uh, that they had seen uh, a plane, uh flying uh you know from the last known uh, position of ma370 they were infuriated they're like you're not being honest with us we want to know everything and you're not telling it to us journalists of which i uh, was one covering at the time were also pretty frustrated you know we like sure. to know what's going on this was a very important case there's 239 lives on board this plane please be open with us now um the the excuse that was given um at the time was well we didn't know that it was ma370 now the first the, the 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 kind of radar we talked about last week, secondary radar. The plane is actively transmitting information. It's transmitting its altitude and it's it's transmitting a code that tells you definitively that this is this plane. When it's just primary radar, all you're seeing is a blip. You don't know. It's not telling you anything. And they have a way to roughly tell how high it's flying, but it's it's very crude. And so you got these crazy. You know. It, so if you look at just the the raw data that was released to the public, it looks like this plane is changing altitudes at an almost impossible rate. And the reason for that is that it is impossible. It wasn't, it, it's just you, what you're seeing is noise in the data. So the, but, and, and also the, the speed was changing at random ways too. It doesn't, if you take that data completely at face value, it doesn't make any sense. So if and you're a guy, if, yeah. if you're a radar, uh, I don't think call them air traffic controllers in the, in the military, but if you're a guy looking right. at radar, a radar guy in the Malaysian Air Force, you, you could legitimately be confused. I mean, this is not, the most first first world air force um it's in the middle of the night but nonetheless it's still flying over their uh their base uh they didn't right. scramble they didn't scramble any jets they didn't tell anyone they yeah. like this if this was the united, all kinds of questions if this was the united states i mean they 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 scramble you know f-15s f-16s all, all over the place uh but that we didn't happen like to think that i mean i think that i think in the popular imagination we've seen like thunderbirds and like all these action movies where tom cruise jumps in a plane and takes off right away that is the kind of the common assumption that i think bears second checking because okay to, because because in fact it's expensive and labor intensive to have like jets sitting on the ground with their engines spooled up ready to go at a moment's notice that's something that would happen in a height of extreme uh tension right so maybe the border between india and pakistan there might be that kind right. of level of tension where people are in, like in, uh, maliciously um in, ingressing other people's airspace um in this case it's like look malaysia has never been at war with another country ever in its history yeah and it has a small air force um, we don't even, and, and so they, they certainly weren't on high alert. They certainly weren't expecting anybody to attack them. Um, we don't even know if they were 
if there if this radar uh, station was even being manned, they might have just left it on auto. And and you know, like your security cam when you go to bed, your security cam is recording anybody that comes to your doorstep, and then you check it in the morning. So that's just, just so significant. Yeah, because it, you're, what you're saying is that a country like Malaysia isn't on emergency standby at all moments because they don't have any active enemies. They don't have a huge budget. We don't know their capabilities. Um, maybe somebody does, and maybe that's part of the story. But yeah. while, it seem, while it seems insane to us, this may have been a pretty typical response to a giant plane flying across this, you know, this, this, this giant, this giant area for hours. It's, yeah. it's, e it's easy to Monday morning quarterback it, but you know, maybe, maybe it's not that weird after all. No, I, I, I but it is again, like, this is a dynamic that we see again and again in the story where people have a kind of a common sense understanding of how things work in the world. And that isn't necessarily true. Like, it isn't necessarily true that people are manning the radar station all night. Um, for instance, a as the plane went up the Malacca Strait, it was also within range of Indonesian radar and Thai radar. And neither of those countries said that they saw anything. Now, did they not see anything because, you know, they just, it, it wasn't turned on, nobody was paying attention, there, maybe, they, maybe it was broken. Uh, we just don't know. We don't know, but but I think the fact that neither neither Indonesia nor Thailand even saw it, I think gives us a data point. It tells us that countries don't always maintain their radar coverage. They don't always see everything that's there, um, even it's a even if it's a big old thing like a triple seven. And that if that seems incredible to people, I would point out that. After in the course of 9-11, as planes were uh, flying around, um, they air traffic controllers lost contact with one of the planes, um, the one that actually um, wound up crashing in Pennsylvania. The fact that the Malaysia Air Force didn't scramble, didn't tell anyone, maybe didn't even know it may not be that surprising for a country like this. I mean, it's not that surprising necessarily that they weren't totally on the ball. They weren't expecting any kind of attack. They weren't, they might not have even had their radar station manned. And so they certainly didn't respond. They didn't launch any fighter jets to explore what was happening. Why was this unidentified plane crossing over one of their air force bases? Um, but what was, I think a little bit more surprising is the fact that they lied about it. They covered. They didn't exactly cover it up, but they they launched this other search area while they were still conducting a search in the first area. Well, they had seen the plane cross over their air force base and fly up the Malacca Straits. Why were they still searching in the South China Sea? It it's sucks like because they wasted a lot. Of, yeah, wasted a lot of valuable time. They wasted a lot of people's energy. They wasted uh, U.S. ships that were yeah. were searching, Australian ships, Chinese ships. Um, it, it, countries started to give up, right? Yeah. And so maybe the ex maybe the excuse is well we weren't one hundred percent sure that it was MA three seventy because it didn't have an identifier tag on it. Well, you know, okay, um, but who else could it possibly have been? Um, so what's important to know is that the plane flew the, as seen on radar. The plane flew up the Malacca Straits. It sort of reached the end of radar coverage area because you can only see so far. You're, you're sending radiation out into space. And then if the plane is too far away, the, re the reflected signal is too weak to be detected by your antenna. So you just can't see it anymore. And it's, I don't think it's that surprising that radars have a limited range and it's um, you know on the order of like one or 200 miles. And so the plane flew to the edge of that coverage and then it disappeared. It was out of radar coverage range. No one else had radar coverage in that area. And the plane has now vanished for a second time. It first vanished from uh, secondary radar, as we discussed last week. And then now it has 40 minutes later disappeared again, this time from primary radar. And so this is a case, this is, this is right then at that point, already the craziest 
Um, yeah. Actually, so I, if it's ever happened. So I got to ask you this. I mean, as a fellow journalist, yeah. at this point, you've already been on CNN. You know, you're talking right. to Aaron Burnett or something. Are you thinking to yourself, like, this is insane? I mean, how? <laughs> What, what, what were you what were you saying to, to these reporters when when you kept finding this stuff out one after another i mean i already my suspicions i'm already like this is not normal this is this something is up my sort of spidey senses were tingling um i had spent a lot of time in air force 447 where a plane had disappeared after leaving um the air traffic control area the fact that this happened so soon after and then it turned this crazy maneuver so what i saw was um, whoever took this plane knew how to fly a plane, right? They knew that, and not everybody knows how to fly a plane. It's just, you're already like reducing your, um, your, your list of culprits a lot by just that fact. They knew where, they knew how air traffic control works. Um, and when they turned back, as seen on this radar, they didn't descend, um, they weren't sort of spiraling downward. Um, they weren't heading for the nearest airport. They were actually, um, probably climbing, although we're not 100% sure, but they were definitely accelerating. They were flying really fast and they were going like a bat out of hell. They were also flying along the Malay Thai border, which might be significant if you're trying to avoid anyone noticing you, you might kind of stick to the border so that no one would think that you were in their airspace. So right away, I'm like, right out of the gate, I'm like, I am suspicious. I think this plane was stolen. Stolen by who? Most likely the pilot, but not necessarily. Um, and so I thought that, um, this was a, this was a, a theft most likely by the captain. And I looked up this word, I'm like, what is this called? It's like not exactly hijacking because you're taking your, your own plane. And, um, the, the, the sort of the term that's used in maritime law is baratry. Baratry is when a ship captain would steal his own ship, usually for insurance fraud purposes. That's so an I remember, excellent vocabulary word. Yeah. I, it's a great vocabulary word, but I remember going on. Um, CNN with Michaela Pereira and then and throwing out this word baratry. I don't think they include it on air, but I'm like, I got very excited about the word baratry because I think that's what's happening here. Now, I later changed my view, but at the time, that was what I was already suspicious that something was up. It's a good thing that we have lots and lots of episodes because there's a million things we could be saying about this. But as right. I was reading old news accounts from you know March 14th, you know you had Interpol saying we don't think this was terrorism. We have the CIA saying maybe it was terrorism, but we don't have any reason to believe it. We have a story about uh, some misconduct with the uh, the co-pilot who who brought some women into the cockpit. Uh, th there was. The thoughts that if they wanted to disappear off of radar, they could have flown really low and really fast, but that would have burned a bunch of fuel, which wouldn't jive with what we found on the radar later. So it just, I mean, it must have been so confusing for media to try to wrap its head around this, but then also for the authorities to wrap their heads around this, because and nothing like this had ever I mean, happened. Think about Every the, the whole the whole I called it the peanut gallery, but everyone had their two cents, you know, it's social media, Reddit, um, and you know, people the, the, I thought it was it had to be some kind of hijacking. Um, but the kind of story that was most appealing to the public were stories like the, the hero pilot, like maybe there was a fire on board and the pilot had turned back because he was trying he was trying to save everybody. The, there was, um, and people like me were starting to trade information when I say like me, I mean, people who had like some knowledge of aviation were trying to trade bits of information and trying to collectively figure it out together, kind of came together on various websites. And there was a guy named Duncan Steele who had a website and he had some really good um, insights into some of the technical aspects that would soon emerge. Um, but he had a policy where he would not let anyone post any theories that involved someone intentionally taking the plane. Like it had, he would only allow accidents or mechanical failure. <laughs> Anything else he thought was disrespectful. And it really kind of shows that it's, you have to be very careful about putting boundaries on your discussion. If you know, if it, if it has to be respectful, then you might, you're really at risk of, of losing track of the truth. Okay, we're gonna go way over our time, but we do have to discuss a couple things, like yes. a couple of the, the theories that people had and why they may or may not have been possible. One that always sticks out to me is that uh, something happened on the plane, a hypoxia, an emergency, and autopilot took over and turned it left. But it's very important for people to realize that autopilot can't make a they I don't actually, know what that angle is, but something that's steep. Yeah, that's not how, it was a 180 degree turn. 
Well, no, it was a, it was a um, it was a, the turn. They, they they didn't figure this out until much later, but they later determined that the turn that was made in that initial turn back after the plane went dark was so steep that it couldn't have been carried out by autopilot. It could only have been carried out like by manual input um, into the plane. So that's and huge. Some people, so someone was alive in the cockpit. If that plane, which it did, which we all agree, or at least for the purpose of this podcast, we agree that that plane turned left. It right. didn't gradually turn left. It, it made turned us... really hard and aggressively. Yeah. So to my so 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 to my mind, this means it was an aggressive act and it was a sophisticated act, meaning that whoever did it at least knew how to flew, at least how to fly a commercial plane. Um, so. There were all kinds of theories, and at this point, we had so little information. It was like, let a thousand flowers bloom, because it was really hard to rule anything out. One of the more interesting ideas was um, that uh, that the plane had snuck under a regularly scheduled flight and was flying like on, in the sort of shadow of another plane that was flying um, to India or something. Mm, and this got a lot of traction actually in those in those days like almost any theory like would get like picked up by the newspapers and stuff so it was uh it was it was a, it was a kind of chaotic time we'd also didn't there was lots of information that turned out later not to be true like the rumor that the plane had landed in cambodia and so we just were completely flabbergasted we knew that the authorities weren't being completely honest with us and we so we didn't really know what was true and what what wasn't but we did know from the minute the, it became clear that the Malaysians had detected this thing on their radar, this was already a very, very unusual case. And they shared their data eventually. So eventually. it's not it's not just No, that. I mean they they shared the initial part of it, but the so the first like 20 minutes, they shared, they've never shared the final 20 minutes. We know that there was one final radar ping at 1822 universal time the final ping, but we don't know anything about it. Like if it was a series of pings, it was a single ping, there's been kind of contradictory noises made about it. So even to this day, there's there's things that we could usefully know that could really, I think, help us narrow down the possibilities that for whatever reason, the Malaysians still aren't fully being frank about. Okay, uh, so here's the part that we talked about in the beginning where we're gonna jump to some current events. Uh, just in the last few weeks, um, some interesting stuff has happened. First of all, you were on a show talking about barnacles. Yeah, what, what, that's what's true. that all about? Yeah, one of the things that's happened very recently is that there's been more inquiries into the barnacles. What are the barnacles? So about 15 months after the plane disappeared, pieces of debris were found floating in the Indian Ocean. And on those pieces were um, these organisms called Lepus anatifera, the goose barnacles. And what's interesting about these creatures is that they grow a shell as they, and they grow very, very quickly. And as they grow, they retain minerals differently depending on what the temperature of the water is that they're in. And so by looking at these shells, you can actually determine where it, it started to grow based on what the temperature of the water is in that area. Now, you can't narrow it down exactly, but it can tell you what latitude um, this happened. And so this was very exciting to the scientists trying to find the plane because now they can say, oh, we can narrow down where, the, where in the ocean the plane might have gone. And so for years, I've been like looking at this data, talking to scientists, the shells have been very closely kept. Um, the, the most important piece of debris was found in a French island called La Réunion. And so the French have this most important piece and they've been very, um, they, they've held it very jealously. They haven't let many people see it. Um, and there's a new report that's just out where some scientists have said, hey, we can we figure out a new way that we can analyze these shells that maybe finally can tell us where the plane went in. There's still no results though, but but again, it's you know nine and a half years later at this point, and we're still getting new new leads emerging. Okay, that's really exciting. All right, let's come back to that. the uh, The second thing you mentioned to me is there's a new UFO theory floating around, and I don't I don't really <laughs> want to get into a whole lot of UFO talk, but I feel like maybe we should at least acknowledge it and move on. Yes, there is new. Somebody came up with a video that supposedly was taken from space. I didn't really waste a lot of time looking at it. A lot of people reached out to me and said, hey, what do you think about this UFO footage? And I'm like, how do you even begin? I mean, it's like, why would you think that there's footage of UFOs abducting MH370? It just, it just sounds so crazy. Yeah. But again, it's like, it's this, this you know, I, I we were talking about this offline earlier. And, you know, I, there's this old um, William Faulkner quote, the past isn't dead. It isn't even past. Um, this is very much alive. MA370 is not a, it's a historical artifact. It's a living 
mystery and it still engages people not always in the most helpful ways okay so that brings up the most important thing um by the time people listen to this uh it'll be a few weeks old but um a very important plane has crashed in russia Mm. and it killed the head of the wagner group um exactly two months after he tried to or prepared to commit a coup d'etat against vladimir putin yeah mr Prigozhin. we don't i don't think at this point i mean everything is always wrapped in a level of, of mystery but either he was shot down with a missile or he was it was blown up um you know with a bomb on board or something but yeah i, I mean everyone knew that Prigozhin was going to get killed and then his plane blows up and I, I i thought it was a little funny the new york times had a headline the effect of you know u.s experts suspect that putin killed Prigozhin or had ordered him yeah like, oh you think <laughs> you know? it uh it's probably the least surprising thing um that i i could have read uh, you know as soon yeah. as soon as they said he was feared dead i was like well of course he's dead and of course putin yeah. did it now yeah. the reason this matters is uh Putin is is a very creative assassin. He has he's killed a lot of people in a lot of really James Bondy sort of ways, whether it be through poisoning or uh, you know, brazen you know shots to the head, or right. uh, in this case, uh, you know, shooting down a plane or something. Um, it's not a surprise to anyone who's seen this Netflix documentary that eventually we are going to talk about the possibility that. Putin and Russia were involved in MH370's uh, disappearance, and the plane might have gone north instead of south. At the time, people thought that was crazy talk. In 2014, they were like, there's no way a world leader could, would go do something like this. But right. if you look at it, and if you, as current as it is right now, uh, Putin's been behind a bunch of assassinations, some more obvious than others, and at least two of them maybe three that have involved plane crashes. I feel like this lends credibility to what we're gonna be talking about a few episodes from now. Well, I I, I think so too. I, and I appreciate you saying that. Um, clearly Putin is a guy who will shoot down civilian planes. Um, you know, four and a half months after MH370 vanished, um, one of its uh, 16 or so uh, sister ships, uh, a Malaysian Airlines 777, was shot down over Ukraine. At the time, it was considered, it was almost universally believed to be a mistake that some untrained militiamen had fired off a missile that they didn't really know how to use. Um, it was later found, thanks to an online group called Bellingcat, that this was in fact carried out by a, re- a regular Russian army unit under the command of the GRU, which is Russian military intelligence. So, uh, you so know. Check that one off. I mean, that's one that happened. I mean, I wrote about this in, in for, for New York Magazine. If people want to check that out, I'll put it in the show notes. Um, but yeah, this the, this kind of reinforces the idea that Putin is a really bad guy who doesn't have a lot of respect for the sanctity of civil aviation, and he will kill innocent people. I he mean, will, yeah. Prigozhin, by, I mean, not, by the way, he, I don't think he's an innocent person, but... No, the world's probably a better... Person. Yeah, the world's probably a better place without Prigozhin running around, but... Um, Nonetheless, I mean, this is this is a very high profile assassination if it happened the way we thought it uh, did. And let's I mean, it did right one way or the other. Putin's behind this. But this 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 kind of stuff, you know, is not unlikely or un, uh, uncommon for him. I was just going through some of the other um, unusual assassinations like Pavel Antov in 2020, in December 2022, fell out of a hotel window in India outside of Russia. So not only is this guy, uh, you know, giving people Russian window cancer, he's doing it outside the borders of, of the Russian Federation, which uh, is a big deal. I mean, it's poison people in, in London with polonium tea. Uh, here's another one, uh, Dan Rappaport. He was a guy who, um, he publicly condemned the Russia-Ukraine war, and he was discovered dead outside of his apartment building in Washington, D.C., um like this guy is doing assassinations on on foreign soil so why would it be so hard for us to believe that he had something to do with mh370 for me it makes perfect sense 
I think that, you know, an important thing to, to, to recognize in this pattern is that sometimes they're very brutal and obvious, and sometimes they're subtle, and sometimes they're super subtle, like involving um, chemicals that were created specifically for this one assassination, and yet they still get found out. So, you know, Putin is a KGB guy, and it's all about subterfuge, confusing your enemies, scaring people, um, you know, creating a constant state of nervousness and uncertainty. And so being really confused good. is part of the game. Right. So we are confused. The intelligence community is confused. That's kind of his intention here. Yeah. And I feel like yeah. that's probably a good place to pause this thing. What yeah. are we going to talk about in episode four? Okay, so 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 far um, today we're talking about how the plane disappeared for a second time after it it, uh, it it left radar. And normally you would think, okay, that's the end of the story. Certainly a plane can't disappear three times. Well, guess what? <laughs> There's <laughs> more shoes are going to drop. So in the next episode we're going to talk about our jaws hitting the ground again, and not for the last time either. I just keep learning more and more, and we'll take listener questions. We keep promising to do that. We've got them. Um, but we're going to save them up because there's just too much to talk about in a half an hour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Next week. Okay, so listeners, again, always, you know, if you like what the show, feel free to, you know, comment or, um, you know, rate it. Like and subscribe. Um, like and Thumbs subscribe. Up. Mash that button, all that good stuff. Um, Andy, thank you again. Always a pleasure. All right. Thanks, Jeff.